So right here, what's the combination of this back door now? Which back door? Um, straight down. Yeah, straight down. down. I assume it should be 135. So first of all, the door oh, was made with one. Um, when you publish it, it's, it's when, you, when, you, when you first click, you want me to go live and click, yeah. click on the YouTube this thing. Is what I, mean, yeah. I mean, the, <laughs> like, the uh, your name title automatically changes its name. Yeah. Let's we'll make sure it's blank. I mean, if it's blank when you sign up, you delete, make sure that your thing is empty. You don't have anything. I guess you know, you can, you can do. So it's other than the machine. Topic alpha. How much do you have to suffer? I put in an old nice answer. That way it doesn't suffer. Does that include psychological suffering? I'm actually going to talk about that. Yeah, it's probably. Excellent question. See, it's still in the front. And how hard is it to get out of the bed in the morning when you come up to the shear? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Top. Ed asks, are we only talking about physical pain? Also psychological pain? No, say for the Huh? Yeah. I experienced that. What did you say? No. You know, in the past, you said how can you have problems? So no, no, you can stay, you can, you can stay until I know the shear is running. Okay. 
morning. I'd like to thank everybody for coming <clears throat> from far and wide, Hollywood, Miami Beach, everything in between. I'd also like to thank the presence of a couple doctors here as we hope to get into medical issues and pain, which is sometimes associated with it. Today is the 10th year site of Rav Nosem Tzvi Finkel, the Rosh Hashiva, the Mir Yeshiva, famous Rosh Hashiva, grew up in America, grew up in Chicago, and rose to fame, rose to fame as leading a Yeshiva which only had a mere 1,500 uh, students when he took the helm in 1990. But by the time he was Nifter, that number swelled to way over 6,000, 7,000 Talmudim. the largest in the world. And it's still to this day, the Mir Yeshiva, Bar Hashem, is the largest Yeshiva in the world. And the story itself, if you just stop there and talk about Rav Nelson Tzvi, how a nice American kid who showed up for the first time in the mirror at 14 wearing a Cubs baseball cap, how he grew to be, grew yeshiva to be such a huge Makam Torah. But what's also quite amazing, and it makes the whole story take on a different level, is that Renaissance Tzvi was stricken with Parkinson's disease for most of the second half of his life. I myself, though I never was officially a Talmud in the mirror, I'm a Talmud of Renaissance Tzvi. And I had the schus of going to a shir every Friday for two years. I used to go He's a set up for the share. Some weeks, Levinson would uh, give us potato kugel. I would sit right across from him, Nelson Tzvi, and a seat at the table. And I, Baruch Hashem, had quite uh, a strong catcher with him. So much so, the last time I saw him, Nelson Tzvi, he came to America after 2000. And uh, he's about to start dating. I wanted the bracha from him before I started. So I remember it was a snowy night in New York. He was staying in Borough Park. I took a bus from my house in Flatbush to Borough Park. Got off the B11, 47th Street. Had to walk to like 55th, 56th, somewhere over there. And there was snow literally almost up to my knee caps. But I remember trudging in the snow to go see Rav Nelson Tzvi. What was amazing what I saw in my days, Baruch Hashem, in my days, Rav Nelson Tzvi was, he walked. Later years, he was limited very much to, to a wheelchair. But he walked, but he couldn't walk straight. He would very strongly waver as he was walking. When you would watch him, he'd be afraid that he'd fall over. When he spoke, sometimes he was able to speak. Everything looked okay. But many times his body, due to Parkinson's disease, would violently shake. And he'd literally hold on to himself to try to hold himself back from shaking. But he just sitting in a chair. He violently shaked from side, shook from side to side. There are times he wasn't physically able to speak. It was challenging for him. He struggled, his mind was clear. He knew what he wanted to say. It was very hard for him to get it towards him. I played a video of him speaking. Of what I saw that was actually a pretty clear video and it looked like a day when he was doing better. And my Talmidim were watching it. They said, Rebbe, it's hard for us to watch. It's painful to watch. And it was something that you saw he lived with, he struggled with this 
disease of Parkinson's, which affected his nerves so greatly. But he kept on doing, to the best of his ability, what he was doing. I remember one time, and a lot of outsiders would come. It wasn't only time even the mayor. And he'd probably get, get 100 people packed into his dining room. I remember one week, he walked, came into the room, walked into the room, he sat down, I believe he tried to give the share, he walked in there. <laughs> he didn't, he wasn't able, he didn't have the strength. I remember him politely uh, telling us, unfortunately he doesn't have the strength, he's not able to do it. He asked us if we could go please learn you know, 15 minutes of Musar in the yeshiva instead of the share. I remember it was like such a sad thing. Here we all came and uh, quietly everyone left. And he went next door. He lived at that point in his life across the street from the yeshiva. And we all went to, to learn Musar because the Rosh Yeshiva wasn't up to, to speaking. Very sad, you know, situation. But at the same time, it might have been sad to watch, but it was tremendously inspiring to watch. This person who was stricken so much with Parkinson's, there are stories of him learning with Kavrusas, he wasn't able to do it normally. He would lay, lay down, he had a couch right next to his table in his dining room. He would lay down on the couch and learn like that to best be able to, uh, to learn in the situation he was in. So the topic I would like to talk about today, Zechad Shmaso, of Nassim Tzvi, and of Olyo Omer, is how far does a person have to go to perform mitzvahs? How far? A person who's stricken with pain, whether that pain is from a current illness, or from a protracted, longer medical situation the person's in, how, how much pain must one put oneself through to perform a mitzvah? I'll tell you one story I remember seeing in particular for a mitzvah. I was by Rav Nelson Tzvi, Silkes Tavshin Nun Ches. 25 years ago. And he was sitting in a sukkah, there was a whole crowd of people there, and it was time for Mincha. So his family, I'll meet him there, saying, Rebbe, we'll make a minion over here in the sukkah. So you look at the Mishabura, Mishabura talks about the whole sukkah, that the person could daven in a sukkah. Sukkah is a place you're supposed to spend your time with. So Providing that the sukkah is a place you can learn, you should learn in the sukkah. Providing the sukkah is a comfortable place to daven, you can daven in the sukkah. So definitely it's sad and halacha that you can daven in the sukkah. You compound that with the element that there's nothing to see, even to walk from his house, basically across the street, maneuver, you know, you know it was a hundred feet, a few hundred feet, it was a big deal for him. It was hard for him. So, if I was with Nelson Tzvi, of course, I'll daven right there in my sukkah. But I watched, that's not what he did. He said, I daven b'kvi is normally in yeshiva. I want to go to yeshiva. Just last night I saw, you know, years before, when he was first stricken with Parkinson's, he lived quite a distance, 10, 15 minutes from the yeshiva. And with his condition, it took much longer. But he insisted, tried it, best of his ability. He, he never opted out with excuses. You know, it's hard for me, so I'll just do the easier option. I'll daven by the local shul. I'll daven in my sukkah. He struggled and made it to yeshiva. So, the shayla I like to pose, is that halacha? Or is that with the Nimishur Sadin? How far does the halacha go in requiring us to perform mitzvahs when we're in pain, when we're in a challenging situation? That's the topic 
that I'd like to talk about today. And I'll give a little disclaimer is you'd think this is a pretty relevant shayla, unfortunately, right? Whether we're talking in an individual situation, a guy wakes up in the morning, has a pounding headache, or as you said, a longer illness. Well, the, unfortunately, these things come up and doesn't seem it's a clear cut topic that, it, that is, is clearly addressed in the postcom. I found, really a lot of the share is based on, I found a piece from Rav Scheinberg. He published a sefer in Mishmeres Chaim, Chelek Dalad, in the back of it. It has psukim that Rav Scheinberg published in different periodicals, like uh, Aguda puts out Amatara, Or Shab, it's all different contrasim. Rav Scheinberg would contribute articles. This is one of the articles he contributed, so comes from Rav Scheinberg himself. But outside of this, I didn't find really too many posts that directly address this at all. We'll see. There are some that uh, that he pulled up. Now, the Pashib shot, the first thing, when you talk about a person who has a challenge, who's sick, who's in pain, the first concept you think of halacha in these scenarios is the idea of onus rachman apatre. Right? Torah doesn't expect from us more than what we can do. So there's a concept of onus rachman apatre. If you're in a situation which is beyond what you can do, you're exempt. For sure. But what constitutes more than you can do? Let's say a person could do it, but he'd be in pain. Let's say a person could do it, but he'll be in a lot of pain. Let's say a person would do a mitzvah, he won't just be in pain, he'll be sick after doing that mitzvah. Do we say in such a scenario, on this Rahman Patre, you don't have to do the mitzvah? Or do we say, no, you should do the mitzvah, and look, this is what's going to happen. You know, people run marathons. I'm sure after a marathon, your body's aching for a few days. <coughs> people play tackle football. People play, people involve themselves in many pursuits. And, you know, there are side effects, collateral damage. So how far does one have to go for a mitzvah? So the first marmakam on your sheets is a Gemara in the There's a similar Gemara in Yushalmi, in Psachim, in Arvi Psachim. The Gemara says like this, Mem Tesema Beis. Amur Ahim Atrenisa There's one Chash of a lady said to Rabbi Yehuda, Mo'i Viroi? Rashi over there in Nadarim, or the Rishon named Rashi there in Nadarim, says, At the Talmud Bahara, you're a Chash of a Talmud Chacham, you're a Posek. The Atar Shikr, Menesha, you put it to Huvim Koshah. She accused him of being a drunk <coughs> because his face would tur turn colors, his face was always flush, it looked like he was. Drinking. Drinking a lot. So at one point this lady said to him, Rav, are you always drinking? And a red nose. Yeah. <laughs> Rabbi Rudolph. <laughs> so Amar La Hamnusa Biade. Ayesasa, you should know. Itamina El Kiddish Vavdalisa of Arbakosi de Pesco. All I need to drink is just the basic Kiddish and Avdala. Arbakosos and the Chagurit Siri may not pass a guy You know what? My face would, I, I, when all I do is I drink the bare minimum. Kiddush, Havdala, Arbakosos. But I have such a reaction from drinking that wine on Pesach 
I am sick from Pesach until Shavuos. I guess you read the count of the Omer, this guy, this Rabbi Yehuda. The Gemara says that he was in such pain, such pain, but that was the side effects that one had on him. Now, just from reading the Gemara itself, it sounds like this Rabbi Yehuda, obviously if he had, I'm sure if he had some other means of, uh, you know, low alcohol wine that he could Rashi figure light. out how Rashi light, right? How to do it, you do it. But we know, you know, those days they didn't necessarily have these uh, things. They just had the strong amount of shevets, right? Back in the times of the Gemara. <laughs> right? It definitely looks like that was the, the wine they had in the times of the Gemara. Right? And Malaga, right? Yeah, yeah. So, Lamaisa is even stronger, you say? Fine. So, Rabbi Huda was literally sick from drinking the Dalakosos. But that didn't stop him. He did it. He drank the Dalakosos, and he took with it. He swallowed the bitter pill that, okay, he's going to be knocked out from Shuas to Pesach. But that's what he did. It's interesting. So he goes, tell me, Rabbi, so you find the Gemara, a Bavli, tell me there's a similar story, you shall be fine. There are lots of stories in the Gemara. It doesn't mean everything's halach lamaisa. Yeah, good point. Until you see a beer hagola on the side of the Shulchan Aruch. If you look in the Shulchan Aruch, Hilchas Pesach, Simen Tov Ayin Beis, Sif Yud. The Chaber writes, Mishina shows a yayin menesha matziko. Also, no. Someone who normally doesn't drink wine because it's mazakim or he's a picky. Where's my picky eaters? Right? He's, a, he's, he's picky. He doesn't like it. Tzarek litical kazasma of lishtos, but kain mitzas arbakosas. He has to push himself to drink it. To be mekayim arbakosas. Interesting. The first part of Mechaber says we're talking about somebody who doesn't drink it because it's mazakim. First, we talk about that. Look, during the regular year, which brings down Lam Vav, during the regular point of the year, you have someone else be moted him with Kiddush. If you really have a problem drinking wine, right? So first of all, if you're Kiddush, many people can say you just use grape juice. Well, okay, even that, too, you, you, you know, the big allergy. Okay, so have someone else be mozi you, that's fine. Dalakosis, you're stuck. You can't have someone be mozi you, dalakosis. That you have to do yourself, the midst of dalakosis. So the Mechaber's writing that even in the rest of the year, you don't drink wine, <coughs> bothers you, but you have to force yourself, you have to push yourself the drinking for arbakosis. What's the source of the Beis Yosef, of this Machaber? So the Bira Gola said, it's the Gemara I quoted you in the Dharam. It's not just Rabbi Yehuda, you know, was a, you know, took one for the team. Yehuda was a Machmer, and he went and he drank wine on Pesach, even though he was sick till Shuz. You know, <laughs> Yeah, we could get into is the Gemara exaggerating? Or, you know, it's not just a loss in the Bible. Your Shami says the same thing. <laughs> People get sick. They got sick for a long time. <laughs> but the but we see from the Machaber, from the Beis Yosef, that this is considered halacha. This is chiyev. There's a chiyev to drink the dal kosos, even if it's going to make you sick. Yes. Are we making an assumption that there is a lot of difference between wine and grape juice? Yes, yeah, so I didn't want to get into that. The burger is asking, are we making a, uh, uh, an assumption the difference between wine and grape juice? For sure, for the Dalakosa, it's a bigger shiloh. So, you know, ideally, for the Dalakosa, one should have wine, a mixture of wine and grape juice. But, yeah, I don't want to get into that whole parsha. 
for Shabbos, it's a little easier with Kiddush than one can have grape juice. But for sure, come low Seder, you need to do the of Dal Gosos, Pashtas that needs to be fulfilled with wine, someone who's sick from wine, buy matzah, you can't eat wheat. Nowadays, you have no problem. Get your oats, get your spelt. Okay, it might cost, you know, a small fortune. And uh, good luck finding a, uh, a shalem. But, the Maisa, right, that you can save someone else, make the moti, and, you, know, you have your piecemeal. But, when it comes to dalakosos, for the most part, there's no wiggle room. You gotta drink wine, ideally. And uh, so if someone's sick, Machaber's writing, still gotta do it. There's a very important Mishabura. The Mishabura right here, first Mishabura, Laman He, Nisha Maziko, Zot the Mishabura, Ratzel Omer, Shemitzar Bishtia. We're talking about a case where the language Machaber uses is it damages him. So the Chavitz Chaim wants to give a translation. What does he mean by hurting him, damaging him? So this is the Chavitz Chaim saying, this is why I understand the Machaber. Ratzel Omer, he means to say, Shemitzar Bishtia also, it's paining him by drinking it. The Koi Birosh of He has a headache, like the Gemara talked about. Major headache, a migraine. The Eid Bechlau Zeh Kishi Yipo and Mishka Mizeh. We're not talking about a case where he's going to be so sick, knock him out, he has to lie down in bed. We're not talking about that. That's not included. So Chavitz Chaim already is being makele. That which we say, you know, you gotta grit it, sit back, take the shot, drink it. That's only if it's gonna give you a headache, a painful headache. But if it's gonna knock you out, not full of mishkov, that the Chavetz Chaim says not included. Okay? So face value. Okay? That means the degree of pain one might interpret this mitzvah, the degree of pain that one is obligated to do mitzvahs, look, is even with a headache. This, I'm, as I'm saying this over now, this uh, might be a new shot or drush. The, the Chazal say, Chosh Perosho, a person has a headache, what should he do? Yasi Torah. It's like the last thing that Talmud wants to hear when he tells his Rebbe, Rebbe, I have a headache. So what does Rebbe say? Gemara says, go learn. So the post shot in the Gemara is somehow learning Torah eases your headache. But according to the way we're understanding it now, right? You have a headache, you know what the Rebbe tells you? Go learn. It's not the Torah. Here's Rebbe Becker, right up your alley. Next time a Talmud tells you he has a headache, you can't learn, quote him, it's with Fereshah, Halacha, Shulchan Aruch, that you have to do a mitzvah even if you get a big headache. Right? It says by Dalakosos you have to drink the Dalakosos despite the fact of a big headache. It talks about a Marayim that got sick from Pesach to Shulis. You gotta do it. Yeah, yeah. Now, but beyond that, a person gets knocked out and fall asleep. The simple reading of the Mishra, one might conclude, oh, that far I don't have to go. But let's read the Sharetzio. Sharetzio and all the Chavitz Chaim's footnotes on his Mishra. Most of the time it's just showing you who the source is. But once in a while he throws in a nice line or two. So look at the Lashon he writes on Nun Beis. He says, if you fall asleep, that's not what the is talking about. He writes, came there early, Pashat. Seems to me I'm the source for such a halacha. I think it's Pashat. The Ein Zed Derech Heiris. You know why when you fall asleep, when you, excuse me, when you knock out to the degree you have to lay down, that you're potter from drinking Dalakosos? Because part of Dalakosos is the mitzvah of Heiris, freedom. I'm drinking like a king. So when a person is knocked out, kings don't get knocked out. 
I mean, at least they shut and knock other people out. <laughs> right, they knock other people out. Right. Well, but a king, that's not Derech Eros. That's not living it up. And that's why your putter, you don't have to drink it to the degree that you get knocked out. It comes Rav Scheinberg with a beautiful deal. That is only applicable by Dal Kosos, where there's a mitzvah of Cheres, but it's mashva for any other mitzvah which doesn't have some requirement of Cheres. The mitzvah would supersede a person even getting sick from it. Let me say that one again. Ouch. Rav Scheinberg wants to make a deal. He says, the Chavetz Chaim went and chopped up this Allah of the Mechaber. The Mechaber is only talking about a headache, but he's not talking about when you go to sleep, knocking you out that you have to lay down. Where did the Chavetz Chaim get this split? He made it up himself, he says. Because when you get knocked out, you have to lay down, that's not Derech Cheres. And the Mitzvah Dalatosos needs Cheres. Okay, but every other Mitzvah, right, there's no Mitzvah when you learned Torah, that it has to be done, the cheres. In laying in your bed, it's not cheres. Not true. The mitzvah applies even when a person is knocked out. Just hits me as I say this over. I just saw a beautiful story. Just nifter a week or two ago. This longtime principal of uh, Yeshiva Flatbush from the Dovid of Yeah. So I knew the family. Is his daughter, <coughs> right? His daughter is the famous professor, uh, Rosenzweig. No, his wife, Yafa Eliach, was a big uh, Holocaust uh, professor. His daughter, <coughs> one son of his, the Rosh Hashiva in uh, YU, uh, Rosenzweig, his daughter is also a big professor. I once learned with the son, to their But, uh, there's a story, he grew up in Eretz Yisrael, and he basically visited the Chazanish right when he came off the boat. The Chazanish at that time was living in a hut in Nebrak. And he came into the Chazanish, he was a 14 year old kid, this way Eliyach, and the Chazanish was literally lying on his bed, cot, whatever he had, learning. And he never saw anything like this in his life. Like he was knocked out, like he had like some discussion with him, like you know, he, he's still learning even though you're he doesn't talk. He says, "Yeah, and that's what you have to do." He saw the Chazanish. He said that that image left him for a lifetime. The Chazanish, it wasn't Derech Harris. Chazanish's whole life wasn't Derech Harris. He lived in a hut at that time in Bnei Brak, but he learned Torah. It's only by Dalit Kosos you need the Cheres, but it sounds like if Scheinberg wants to be Medayek, that even if a person would make himself get sick through doing this mitzvah, beyond the headache, be knocked out, still have to do the mitzvah. Okay, don't stop here. Uh, Scheinberg will uh, qualify it a little bit more in a moment. But that's what seemingly emerges from this Makar from the Chavetz Chaim here in the Mishabru. Now, Rav Scheinberg, a very interesting piece. He says, you know, he, he probably realized if, he, if this is his, uh, the end of his thesis, people are going to come after him. Rabbi, gosh, you're making us do mitzvahs even when we get sick. You know, everyone's going to try to uh, knock off his proof. So he, you know, like a good lawyer, right? You prepare for what the other side is going to try to say against you. Right? That's what we, they train us to do over here in Rebbe School, too. You have to figure out what the Talmud's going to say and uh, figure out how to uh, come back. I mean, I'm always trying to think one step ahead. So, if Scheinberg was afraid, someone's going to come back and say, you know what? Maybe my proof that I'm bringing here is limited to Dalakosos. Maybe the mitzvah of Dalakosos is more special than any other mitzvah, and that's why that mitzvah you gotta do to the fullest, even if it knocks you out, even if you get sick. But any other mitzvah, you don't. 
Why would thou those be such a big mitzvah? Zechir Tzitz Mitzrayim? Come on. We have lots of mitzvahs which are Zechir Tzitz Mitzrayim. Why would thou Kosos be such a big mitzvah that maybe we would have a higher standard for how far we have to do to do the mitzvah? So he brings the idea, which really Mishabur himself talks about in other spots, is the concept of Pursume Nisa. Right? Hopefully, right? Soon, it's Kislev, Hanukkah. We know of Pursume Nisa by Hanukkah. We know Pursume Nisa exists also by Purim. But Pursume Nisa also exists by Dalakosis. Dalakosis is also a din of Pursume Nisa. If I remember correctly, he once gave a share on those three topics. Assuming Nisa by Hanukkah, Purim, and Pesach. So one might argue that to do this wonderful mitzvah, pursuing Nisa, so there a person has to do it to the extent of even getting set. But any other mitzvah, davening in the morning, especially davening, Kriyashma, Tefillin, all these things, a person's really sick, person really going to get sick from doing it, you don't have to do it. There are only two mitzvahs with, for which you have to sell the shirt off your back. Right? Very good point. Right? Mr. Merov is bringing a, a, a beautiful raya that we find by mitzvahs of Pursume Nisa. Right? Dal Kosos is one of the things, yeah. To get Dal Kosos, you know, you should sell the shirt off your back. Now, Practically, hey, we try to have uh, communal funds available for people that really can't afford, and uh, we want people keeping the shirt on their back. <laughs> we have communal funds to make sure people can keep uh, shirts on their back, hopefully. But Lamaisa, this idea of pursuing Nisa being more of an obligation to stretch yourself thin to do it, yeah, that maybe that's what the what, uh, Machaber is saying. So what's your ride to every other case? So Rav Scheinberg found the Bir Halacha in Sun Tuf Reish Nunvav. The Bir Halacha seems to expand these Halachas of how far you have to go uh, for, for, for the mitzvah of, uh, of Dal Kosos. He stretches it to other mitzvahs too. If you look over there, he brings the Agav Oropol, the Mashi Koshali, Mashi Tiku, Right? We're talking about similar idea. How far does a person have to go? You have to go begging door to door to purchase tefillin. We hold that by near Hanukkah, by Dal Kosos, a person has to knock on doors, as was mentioned before. Avshim Rak Mitzvah Drabana. Those are only rabbinic mitzvahs. The Kosh came in Yenenu. Vafilu Yim Tomar and the Mishra Pursumi Nisa Tiknu Rabbanim came. And even if you're going to say, you know what, Rabbi? You're trying to prove me by tefillin. You should sell, sell the shirt off your back. If you don't have that knock on the doors to, to buy tefillin. Where are you proving it? You prove from Dal Kosas and Hanukkah. Well, maybe Pursume Nisa is different. The Svar that we just mentioned before. Maybe that's where you have to go so far to for Pursume Nisa. He says, Mayan of the Kaimal on the L. The Benir Shabbos, Shalom Sachim, okay, at Shaman, Umadaka there. She's a Bechal on the Shabbos. Although on the Shabbos, Rock Mitzvah says, same with the Kabbalah. The shofar, he found the Yaakov Emden asked his kasha, and he ended with the kasha. But what do you see from the Chavetz from the Chavetz Chaim's perspective? You can't say the svara here by the halacha of how far money monetarily you have to spend to do a mitzvah. You can't limit it to only near Hanukkah and only Dal Kosa because presuming no, it expands beyond that. So if Scharnberg saying, just like when it comes to financially how far a person has to go, it's Mistaver, the Sora Pursuing Nisa, would be the same thing when it comes to how far physically a person has to go to perform a mitzvah. And 
don't view it as something special because of pursuing Nisan. Not true. Here the Chavetz Chaim is saying it would apply to any mitzvah. So that would bring us right back to his source, to his proof, that there would be no limitation of even the person in Chaz getting sick by doing a mitzvah that shouldn't stop a person. A headache shouldn't stop a person. And even Nafal and Mishka, a person totally gets sick. The only reason why Dalit Kosos, it stops, is because it's not Derek Hiras. You're not being a king, king, you know, being sick and drinking wine. But for any other mitzvah, look, the Chaz is laying there to learn Torah. A person that could do, sounds like a person should do as much as he can. Even the Chaz person is going to get sick. Now, I should definitely clarify. Okay, so so far, these, this is the basic source. This Gemar Nadarim, this Shulchan Arach, the basic earlier sources in the Mishaburah for how far a person has to go for a mitzvah. Now, of course, you must speak out. Chas v'shalom, it's a sakana. The person is going to put himself in a situation where it's sakana stafashos. His mom is, you know, it's, he's going to be deathly sick by such a thing. Pashat, a person doesn't do that. Pashat, if a person would do that, that would be an Avera, be a mitzvah above Avera, or even worse, it wouldn't be a mitzvah. That's Pashat. If we're talking about a person, Chaz Hashem, getting deathly ill from such a thing, we're not talking about that. Pashat. Now, <clears throat> Ruf Scheinberg has another qualification. She goes through this whole piece, and he ends up saying he thinks it's the correct Chachra, Psak. He says another level it gets played. Even if you're going to say you're chayed, even when the person makes himself sick, but there's two ways of making yourself sick. You make yourself sick, and okay, you know, you rest up the next day and you'll be back to normal. Take some, you know, some Tylenol, some aspirin, whatever you need, and you get back, you bounce back. That might be included for how far a person has to go to do a mitzvah. But if it will have lingering long-term effects, as Scheinberg says, yeah, that's posh. It doesn't have to be sakanas to fashas. Anything with a lingering long-term effect that a person doesn't have to do. You know, I won't name the name at the moment, but there was a story of an adult. I assume he didn't know about it when he was doing it. But he was learning, and the light went out, you know, and he sat there, you know, learning, despite the fact there's no, you know, clear way of seeing it. And the story is that this person lost eyesight over that. Over the, you know, he did this over time, and it took away from his eyesight. So had the person known that was the situation beforehand, we'd see, Scheinberg would say that that's beyond the scope of a mitzvah. You have a long-term lingering effect that you shouldn't do. But something more short-term, that Rav Shaimuk will say, look, you know, sometimes there's a price to pay for doing a mitzvah. We said before, there's a price to pay, you run a marathon, there's a price to pay, you know? Uh, it hits me the story now also. I, I see a lot of people heard that beautiful story. You know, uh, there was a boy in the summer, I was actually in New York that day, but uh, a kid that got lost, somehow his camp went, uh, near the Belt Parkway in Brooklyn, went uh, on a trip, the kid didn't get back on the bus, he came back to camp without the kid, and they made a major search, and they found him by the marshes, by the water, going out to the Atlantic Ocean. After hours and hours, it was pouring rain, and ended up, and the person who found him was a Zaidi. It was a guy who was, uh, you know, could have hit retirement age. And uh, he said, he, if it was my grandson, I'd want to go. I remember him talking about the fact, you know, he was searching for hours. And it came to a point where he said, you know, I have to be worried about my health. He felt he gave it his all. He said, worried about my health. He was turning back. As he was turning back, he came 
chemical and you heard the kid say, you know, copy. And this, you know, of all the literally hundreds upon hundreds of uh, people looking for it, boom. I could have sparkle worked out. Who's the one who found him? <laughs> Some Zaydi. You know, trying his best to do what he can. So, uh, Maisa, we do see this concept, this idea. A person can try to do as much as they can. You know, assuming in a situation like that, you, you, expect, you, you extend yourself for hours. You know, that's not your new, normal uh, exercise routine. It's beyond that. You can be knocked out the next day, next couple of days. But Maisa, that uh, Rav Scheinberg would say, that's an acceptable price to pay for a mitzvah. Is Rav Scheinberg saying, when he says putter, is he saying putter and mutter or putter and usser? Yeah, good question. There is a situation where a person has a lingering health effect. I think in that case, Rav Scheinberg would say, you should not do it. And in yeah, fact, one of the halachas I have down here, I put down Rav Scheinberg's psalkim. Firstly, he says, they write it out, this is a Talmud writing over the Psalkim emerging from the tshuva that uh, he produced. He says, a person has to put himself even to the extent of being sick, or tsar go to the kind of mitzvah. And, but he does qualify two things. If a person's gonna have, like I said, a uh, lingering health element, we say no in such a situation, you do not do the mitzvah in such a scenario. And then he says also, what happens if me doing this mitzvah now, I won't be able to do multiple other mitzvahs. Now, of course, there's a concept. You're searching for a kid. So you also be mitzvah, patr and mitzvah, you have You're not solo man at this point. You have from uh, doing other mitzvahs. What he means is because I'm going to be sick, I'm going to be knocked out from doing other mitzvahs. So then we say it's mutu that you should move out to one mitzvah to be able to perform many other mitzvahs. So the person knows he's really going to be knocked out and won't be able to do other things. Okay, that's also Cheshmer of Shandr says. I'll tell you one other interesting psaq was originally asked. We're talking for the most part today about physical elements. What about mental elements? And I came across an amazing psaq. It's recorded in Halicha Shlomo of Shlomo Zaman, listen to his perspective, his knowledge, understanding of people. And I always love when I give a share, anytime I mention of Shlomo Zaman, I miss him. <clears throat> but uh, the people that knew of Shlomo Zaman would, uh, would understand his sensitivity. That, I'm thinking of Michael, <clears throat> but uh, Rav Shlomo Zaman was once asked by a person, his doctors gave him orders, you could only leave your house one time a day. It doesn't say, doesn't say for what exactly his ailment was, but it was something serious enough, he was confined to his house, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't contagious, but he could only leave his house one time a day. So the question he posed to Rav Shlomo Zaman is, what should I leave my house to do? So the from simple answer say, you go to Shul Dabba with a minion. Listen to Rabbi Shlomo Zaman told him. Good. Now, I think it's assuming the Shul that you down for a minion is a quiet Shul. So you'll see in a second. <laughs> Shlomo Zaman said he should go to work. You can only leave your house once a day. You should go to work? They need the money? Don't look at this far. Shlomo Zaman said, because you're stuck in your house, I assume the situation must have been, you didn't really see people in his house. For your mental health, it's good to go to work, get back to normal, see people, talk to people. It's good for that. I guess, Louis Tzur, you could have some social interactions in Shul too, and Avin, maybe she go to Shul. But <laughs> Shul Mazama was talking about balancing, you know, a certain normalcy. Shul Mazama was ready to forgo the person he says, you're, you're sick. The doctor says you can't leave your house, you can't leave your house. I oh, won't be able to dominate with a minion. Okay, don't dominate with a minion. But go work. Fascinating. It's so. the effects of that COVID. Yeah, very good point. Right? If Shlomo Zalman was ahead of his times, as Harvey's pointing out, you know, in COVID, Rahman people were cooped up, not able to go. You know, that hurt people mentally. 
And you saw people decline, people get older, people lose out from life if they're not being involved in it. It was a lot worse than that. We saw people passing away, particularly people in their 20s and 30s. Yeah. Because they couldn't have the social interaction. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if anything, you're right. You know, it's just, just being on social media for the young generation is not good either. Now, I'd just like to conclude with the story I just heard about in Lost in Sphere, which I've never heard before. And uh, some of the doctors maybe will be able to uh, understand this from. There is, Lost in Sphere had doctors in Eretz that to deal with this Parkinson's disease. But he also saw doctors in America who come to America a lot to fundraise. In fact, it's estimated in his lifetime, Shlomo Zalman, excuse me, Lusson Tzvi raised $500 million for the Miri Yeshiva. He was a tremendous fundraiser. And he came a lot to America to fundraise. Let's see doctors there, experts in Parkinson's. He was a firm Jew, a little strict with Parkinson's. And uh, he was commenting to his doctor, you know, it's so disheartening, this idea. He says, I'm not able to dive in, I'm not able to learn. My whole life is so affected by Parkinson's. Listen to what the doctor told him. And this story was sent over by the person at her soul, at her Nassim Tzvi's shiva. The person told him, the doctor told him, he says, you know what? Okay. HIPAA violations. Right? You know, Renaissance yeah, Tzvi is also my patient. And I can tell you, his case of Parkinson's is 10 times worse than yours is. The person was blown away. With his condition, he felt he couldn't do anything. Renaissance Tzvi had it 10 times worse. The doctor told him he was able to do so much. There's a concept, it's Gemara and Yuma. I'll close with this. Gemara says, Hill Machaidis Aniyim. Hillel, who was so poor in the case, Florida, it's hard to relate to, but a right, snowy day, couldn't get into the base matter. She goes up to the roof to try to hear, try to listen. And, you know, that's how far Hillel went to learn Torah. Hillel Machayev Saniyam. My Rebbe, Reb Hanach was asked, what do you mean Hillel Machayev Saniyam? Marashach. If Aniyam are able to do, to learn Torah, do mitzvahs despite their poverty, then of course they have to learn. They have to do mitzvahs. If they're not able to learn because of their poverty, because of their... So then, they're potter. What do you mean Hillel Machayev Saniyam? What does Hillel have to do with their personal situation. If they're able to do it, they have to do it. If they're not able to do it, they're potter. Shiva explained that Hill Machaidis means when you see a person like Hill, who despite his situation was able to accomplish so much, that gives you a certain inspiration, it gives you a certain ideal that will could give a person more calculus than he thought he, was, he had beforehand. I didn't think I was able to do such a thing. When I see someone like Hillel, Hillel Mechayi Vesaniyim, now an Ani has a new perspective how far I could go to do a mitzvah. I think the same thing applies to Ramos and Tzvi. This halacha, this concept, Onus Rachman Patre, of course we're exempt in situations which are too hard, it's beyond their capacities. But when you hear of a person who, despite being so stricken with Parkinson's, did so much, accomplished so much, it's Machayevas. The Zaydi who goes searching for the lost kid in Brooklyn, it's Machayevas. Whatever we can do to the best of our abilities, a mitzvah is worth it. And that demonstration is a beautiful demonstration of Kiddush Hashem, not just for ourselves, but really for anyone else watching. And also observing, you know, is quite inspiring. And yes, that's one other thing that we lost out during COVID. You know, it's good for the younger generation to see an older generation involved in coming to Shul and davening and doing mitzvahs because it's inspiring for us all. As Hashem, we shall have the health to do mitzvahs, the shalva, 
simcha, but to realize how far a chiv to perform a mitzvah, even with the serious nefesh. Thank you very much for listening, and have a wonderful week.